This program was made before the Sandinistas lost the elections of February 1990. Typically, states regard the general population as an enemy. That's normal. The task and role of the population is to be apathetic, obedient, passive. Uh, if it's what's called a democracy, they're supposed to show up every once in a while to ratify elite decisions. But if they get involved in anything beyond that, they're causing trouble and they have to be controlled uh, and they're an enemy. In the case of one of those newspapers, uh, what happened is that the U.S. run security forces surrounded the office with tanks, uh, uh, destroyed it, uh, drove the editor out of the country with assassination threats after several assassination attempts. That took care of one of them. In the case of the other one, the our security forces, they're our forces, remember, our security forces picked up the editor and a, another journalist in a in a restaurant in San Salvador, took him outside, cut him to pieces with a machete, and left him in a ditch somewhere, the rest of them. That took care of the second newspaper. So there's no more problem of freedom of the press in uh, El Salvador. Meanwhile, I should say in Nicaragua, nothing remotely comparable has happened. The opposition claims harassment, and of course it always hits the front pages of the newspapers, but they're not expecting to be murdered or tortured. And, and this opposition is extreme. It's the kind of opposition which has never survived in, in a Western democracy in times of crisis. Uh, La Prensa, for example, and the groups around it, uh, are openly support the U.S. attack against Nicaragua. Nothing secret about it. I... Some people call him a radical. Other people say he's just a realist. I'm referring to Noam Chomsky, one of America's outstanding intellectuals. We have a speech which he gave in which he analyzed the American mass media, the American power structure, and the American policy in Central America. And you'll be able to see it right now on Alternative Views. Although this presentation by Noam Chomsky was made before the Sandinistas lost their elections of 1990, his analysis and information are still extremely important to view and listen to because the establishment media did not present them. Today we have a videotape of a talk with Noam Chomsky, who's one of the top critics of U.S. foreign policy in the media. Chomsky, for the last 30 years, has been attacking U.S. intervention in the Third World, U.S. secret covert wars, and the media's covering up of these events in American foreign policy. I first heard Chomsky talk in 1966 at Columbia University when he was the first intellectual to really speak out against U.S. intervention in Vietnam. And he wrote article after article, making speech after speech, documenting U.S. intervention in Vietnam, the secret wars in Laos and Cambodia, and attacking U.S. foreign policy. Throughout the 70s, Chomsky continued to document U.S. intervention in different parts of the third world and of the media covering up the U.S. foreign policy crimes and presenting legitimations of U.S. Uh, policy. Recently, Chomsky with his friend Ed Herman have published a book called Manufacturing Consent that talk about how the mass media develops, operates to develop consent around U.S. foreign policy and for support of the capitalist system and an imperialist uh, foreign policy through a variety of different strategies. Chomsky and Herman offer what they call a propaganda model for the media in which they have a theory of the different filters through which the media filters out uncomfortable content, content that would be uncomfortable for those that run the media, those that in, are involved in the U.S. Uh, power structure. Frank, what's the uh, first filter? 
that Chomsky talks about? Well, the first one they talk about is the uh, twin thing of limitation of ownership. For one thing, technological advances since the 19th century started, or since the 20th century started, has have made it uh, impossible for and just anybody with limited capital be able to start a mass medium. It just requires too much. And then, of course, when you do need capital, you've got to go to the banks. And so if you uh, can't, don't have access to the banks, as uh, any uh, labor or working opposition wouldn't get any money from the banks, well, then you're just out in the cold. It just too much technology and too much money for uh, normal uh, working class people or organizations to be able to have a mass medium. And that leads to the second filter. Which is the advertising license to do uh, business. Chomsky points out that in the 19th century, in the United States and in Britain and most uh, capitalist democracies, there was a very vigorous working class press. That all the different left-wing political parties, the unions, the anarchist movement, all had their press that was very critical of the existing system, the capitalist power structure. And there were attempts of the, of the, by the governments in the 19th century to uh, censor this left-wing uh, press. Finally, they decided it was better to let the marketplace uh, do it. One of the ways that the marketplace worked to filter out the left-wing press and unpopular opinions, opinions would be unpopular to the capitalists, was through advertising-supported media. By making media, the press, later broadcasting, um, dependent on advertising support. This meant that advertisers had the choice of who they would invest their advertising revenues in, what sorts of newspapers, what sort of television and other uh, media. So this forced the press, the broadcast media today, to submit to the needs, to the ideologies, uh, to the interests of the uh, advertisers and only to broadcast ideas that advertisers would want to um, support. In fact, Frank, there's another sense in which both business control of the media and advertising support of the media in even a more direct way filters out unpopular opinions within these mainstream uh, media. And that is that the big media, like the television networks, have a gatekeeping function. They have managers, reporters, who filter out ideas that will not be uh, hospitable to the owners of the press, to the uh, power structure and the people that uh, control them. And likewise, advertisers have ways to mm -hmm. censor programs. Um, General Electric once uh, was one of the sponsors of 2020. And when Jane Fonda came on, who's an outspoken uh, opponent of nuclear energy that General Electric is uh, deeply involved in, uh, they refused their sponsorship. So this put a message out to 2020 and other documentary shows that if you want to get GE sponsoring, you can't have an yeah. anti-nuclear um, point of view or advocate. So this filters out the anti-nuclear point of view. In fact, General Electric now owns NBC. Right. They've completely uh, <laughs> taken over. NBC is easily the most conservative of all the uh, networks, and that's because the ownership uh, creates a sort of ethos within the news and the documentary uh, sections of these uh, media. The, the people like Tom Brokaw and the others that produce the news know that if they want to keep their jobs, they can't say anything that GE doesn't want to hear or they're out. So it's these kinds of filters uh, Chomsky is talking about, advertising, ownership, that filters out on popular opinions. Unpopular from their point Unpopular of view. Unpopular from their point of view. <laughs> right. Popular from our point of view. <laughs> The third filter is the sources which are used by the establishment uh, media. The uh, establishment media reporters and all, they, because of economics and lack of time and lack of number of reporters, they go to where it's easy to get news. And where do you get that? Well, from government sources, where there are leaks and there are press conferences. So you get the State Department. It's easy to get stuff from them and the Pentagon and the White House. And at the local level, you go down to the uh, local uh, uh, police department to get the news. And also business corporations and trade organizations are good sources. That's one aspect of this uh, mass news uh, media sourcing. But the media go further than that. The reporters think that ipso facto, these people in government and business are credible because they have status and prestige and they wear neckties, those little phallic, cloth phallic symbols to show that they're male. And so anyway, uh, 
then the flip side of this is that they look askance at anybody who has different points of view, either from the right or from the left. They will take the words of these establishment people without question, because they're objective. We just reported what they said. If they're lies, that's not our fault. If Reagan lies, we're just reporting what he says. But if somebody, say from the left or, no, left or Noam Chomsky, they, well, we don't know, we better check this out before we talk to him. Anyway, we can't find any good, reliable people from the left. So that's why you get just a narrow range of people and ideas coming from the media. What's the fourth filter? The fourth filter is slack in their enforcers. The media <laughs> are very sensitive to public opinion because one, they depend on high ratings um, for their advertising rates. They don't want to do anything to alienate broad sectors of the audience. And secondly, the advertisers are also responsible for public opinion or are also responsive to public opinion because they're very worried about boycotts of their uh, products. They don't want to be associated with controversial shows. So if any programming gets a lot of flack from different right-wing uh, groups. The uh, networks uh, are very worried about this, as advertisers are. So the very fact of the possibility of flack filters out um, controversial opinion that might uh, arouse the ire of different right-wing groups. And in the 1970s and the 1980s, a lot of these right-wing groups organized themselves to give flack in case there's any liberal or leftist or progressive views in the media that the right wing doesn't uh, like. Uh, the, the organization um, Accuracy in Media, Jerry Falwell's uh, Christian uh, groups, and various other uh, right wing uh, groups uh, fo give phone calls, write letters to the media, give them flack every time there's something on there that uh, they don't like. And it's this kind of uh, pressure that makes the media also uh, filter out controversial ideas and particularly liberal or uh, progressivist ideas. Mm -hmm. The fifth filter is anti-communism. We've seen that, uh, those of us who grew up in the McCarthy era and all have seen this happening for decades and how it's used for social control as well as how to control what's happening in the medium because if somebody happens to say something that's a little too liberal or left, they're soft on communism or they're promoting the communist line. So it helps to fragment the left and it also permits those right-wing elements in left organizations like the labor unions or no, what should be left organizations like the labor unions. It helps the anti-communists to be able to take control of these and purge any of the more progressive elements out of it. It helps to keep opposition uh, politicians in line too. Just say, oh, you're soft on communism. That's enough to make any of these lily-livered uh, liberals run for sure. Hmm. So with all these different filters, the mass media, according to Chomsky, manufacture cons consent to the existing uh, system. People conform to, submit to, the institutions, values, policies of the established uh, society, and the media make sure that nothing gets in that's going to disturb this uh, legitimacy of the system, that's going to raise questions, create uh, problems for the managers of the uh, system. Moreover, Chomsky and Herman go through a lot of case studies in which the media manufactured consent around U.S. foreign policies in Vietnam, the Reagan policy in Central America, all of the different ways that the media actually served the interests of conservative policy by manufacturing consent around these uh, policies or the subject matter of these uh, books. But there is also a problem which media constantly have, and that is they say, okay, we're the watchdogs of the system, we're objective, we present all points of view. And so they have to do a little bit of muckraking. They have to bring in a little bit of other things. And you have some reporters who are really seriously interested in digging into some of the skeletons. And so you do find some of these things happening in the media. So this drives the uh, uh, people and the elites and the right wing crazy. But the, as Chomsky and other people have pointed out, this still can be effective because they don't present enough of the of opposing points of view or enough alternatives to the way of looking at things or doing things.
So the people really can become just kind of confused or disoriented uh, rather than completely believing the establishment line. So this is functional too, along with apathy. They hope that the populace will be apathetic and the media have a way of, of doing this also. Well, now let's turn to Noam Chomsky and get his views on the American power structure, the mass media, and the American policy towards Central America. It's a production of the Media Process Group, some access uh, activists in Chicago, and the program is called Labor Beat. of public access, a labor access channel. The worker of Chicago should be not only consumers, but producers of information. As the streets are a podium for free speech, the airwaves are a forum for visual expression of our concerns as people who shape and create our society. What's the next phase of the war and peace process in Central America? On March 2nd, 1988, Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics and philosophy at MIT, spoke on this question at the Northwestern University campus, sponsored by the Evanston Committee on Central America. Chomsky is the author of numerous books and articles on international affairs and is an expert on Central American politics. Here are excerpts from that speech. What I wanted to do was focus attention on the uh, coming phase of the conflict now well over a century old between the United States and uh, essentially the population of Central America. That's been an ongoing war, an unequal war. The victims are all over there, and there are many of them. Uh, it entered a, a new phase in the 1980s, and it entered another phase uh, beginning on February 3rd change in the character of this war, and I do want to focus on this coming phase. Uh, February 3rd I pick because that was the day in which the Congress, responding to uh, substantial popular dissidents, uh, imposed certain limits on the, uh, what the World Court called the unlawful use of force by the United States in its attack against Nicaragua. Uh, I'll come back to the background and details of that, but let me mention that February 3rd is also opens a new phase in another war that's been going on at the same time, and that's a war between the, our government and uh, its population. Now that's not unusual. Typically, states regard the general population as an enemy. That's normal. The task and role of the population is to be apathetic, obedient, passive, uh, if it's what's called a democracy, they're supposed to show up every once in a while to ratify elite decisions. But if they get involved in anything beyond that, they're causing trouble and they have to be controlled uh, and they're an enemy. Now, among elite groups, there are variation. There are tactical variations. And the Reagan administration happens to be at a rather extreme end of a spectrum, but it is, it's not, a, the spectrum hasn't changed. It's the old spectrum. They just happen to be extremists within that spectrum, and their fear and hostility of the general population is also extreme. Uh, also, they happen to be pretty open and frank about it, so they tell you, if you bother to listen. Uh, one of the first things that the Reagan administration did back in the early 80s was to establish within the State Department uh, a thing called the, an institution called the Office for Public Diplomacy, which had the task of controlling public debate and discussion, setting the framework for discussion. So it carried out uh, operations like what they called Operation Truth, which is one that Orwell would have loved. And it had about as much relation to truth as you would expect something to have with that title. Uh, it was exposed, all of this was exposed more or less last summer uh, in the, by one of the few reporters who actually gave serious coverage to the Iran-Contra hearings. By that I mean didn't just pick up the release that was handed out, but actually bothered to look up the documents, Alfonso Charty of the uh, 
Miami Herald uh, back around July or August or so. He exposed the, he did an a study of documents that had been released about the Office for Public Diplomacy, and he went to members of the Reagan administration, high administration officials, and asked them to explain, you know, account for all of this, and they were quite frank and happy about it. They described the, this brainwashing operation uh, as one of their most spectacular successes, and one which is correct, if you think about elite opinion, uh, was very successful in setting the discussion and debate about Central America and Nicaragua in particular. Uh, in fact, one high administration official described uh, the, uh, these operations to Charty as the kind of operations you would carry out in enemy territory. Now that's a telling and accurate phrase. From the point of view of the administration, the population is enemy territory, and the people are inhabitants of enemy territory, and you got, if you can't control them by force, you've got to control them by propaganda. Now again, that's not a position that's unique to this administration. It's a standard position. Uh, I go in, into it later if you like. It's, very, it's long articulated in our history, back to the origins of, the, of our society, and it's very typical of other societies as well. Uh, but the Reagan administration is at an extreme point. Uh, and they, did, they were very proud of their successes in the war that they conducted in enemy territory at home, that is the ideological war. Uh, now, uh, if, you can't control the, if you can't control the population by force, and you, even, and you can't even control it by, uh, by propaganda, the state is, faces a dilemma. And there's about only one thing they can do in that case, and that is to go underground. And in fact, that's just what happened during the 1980s. Operation Truth worked very well. The Office of Public Diplomacy succeeded very well among elites who basically agreed with the policies anyhow, but it didn't work very well among the general population. In fact, it worked very badly. The population is more dissident and active today than any time in the last generation, contrary to what you often hear. Uh, there's not much articulation of this because the elites don't reflect it, and Congress is only a very weak reflection of it. The media virtually no reflection at all. But in the general population, there's plenty of activism and dissidents, and you can tell it, and the Reagan administration learned it very quickly. They were very quickly driven underground. Uh, they were driven underground by the uh, opposition, the inhabitants of enemy territory, who were not going to tolerate the actions that they intended to carry out. Now, clandestine activities in any state are a pretty fair measure of the level of popular dissidence. P open violence, open overt terrorism and aggression are far more efficient than clandestine terrorism. They just work a lot better. Uh, and furthermore, they don't bear the risk of exposure, which sort of causes all kinds of problems when it occasionally happens. So when a state turns to clandestine terrorism, clandestine violence, it's because it's forced to, and it's forced to by its own population. Clandestine activities are not a secret from anybody else. What are called covered operations are obviously not a secret to the victims. Uh, the kinds of operations that were in there, and so it takes, say, the operations that were partially exposed during the Iran-Contra hearings, Plainly, they weren't a secret to the victims. Uh, they weren't a secret to the mercenary states who were enlisted in the cause. Uh, they weren't a, a secret to shady businessmen like uh, you know, Richard Secord and the rest out to make a buck. In fact, they weren't even a secret to Congress and the press, if you want to know the truth. They were just at a low, low enough level so they could be suppressed. The only people that they were a secret from was enemy population, the enemy territory at home. There they, they were a secret. The general population didn't know about them, uh, and that's the point of, of clandestine operations. Clandestine operations are always, a, in part, a war against the domestic enemy. And when a state carries out extensive clandestine operations, it's very much afraid of its domestic enemy. And that's what happened in the 1980s. During the period August to January, August 87 to January 88, the uh, Reagan administration, Congress, and the media so elites generally, had a certain task. Their task was to demolish the Guatemala City Accords to which they were opposed. Uh, and uh, uh, the Accords were unacceptable to Washington, therefore they had to go. Uh, well, how do you do it? Uh, there were a number, let me first notice that there were a number of features of the Accords which were completely unacceptable in Washington. The central feature of the Accords was what the simultaneity feature. You look at the way the Accords were structured, they were based on the idea that a number of things have to happen simultaneously in the various countries and so on. Now that's unacceptable to the United States for two reasons. For one thing, 
uh, the simultaneity requirement would place barriers in the way of the United States attack against Nicaragua. Uh, and that's obviously unacceptable if the, because the United States intends to continue the attack in one way or another. Uh, so that's out. And on that, there's an elite consensus. There's no debate over this in the media or in Congress, with very marginal exceptions. The simultaneity condition has to go. The accords must be interpreted so that they apply to Nicaragua and Nicaragua alone. That's what that means. And that was done very effectively. There have been a number of studies of the media that give the exact numbers, but anybody who's been reading the papers or watching the tube knows the story. Uh, the idea that there have to be a number of things happening at once is unacceptable because it would place barriers to the U.S. attack. And since that's unacceptable, simultaneity condition, which is the core of the accords, has to go. Uh, there's another reason why the simultaneity condition is unacceptable. It would place barriers on the U.S. attack against the populations of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras uh, because the accords call for uh, measures to preserve uh, liberty and security and freedom and you know access to free expression and so on and so forth, a whole range of measures which are completely unacceptable to the United States and cannot be possibly be carried out unless without structural changes in those countries that would take that would eliminate the whole security apparatus, which was designed with the support of the United States in the case of Guatemala and Honduras, and, and developed and imposed by the United States in the case of El Salvador, designed precisely for the purpose of preventing that to happen. Uh, it was designed for the purpose of traumatizing, repressing, uh, 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 torturing and killing, if necessary, the domestic population, uh, so that they won't cause any problems anymore. Uh, those are the kinds of states where you don't worry about propaganda. You go after the jugular if people start to open their mouths. Uh, and that's what we did down there, uh, and plainly those measures cannot be stopped. There's no way for the accords to apply to the U.S. terror states. It's inconceivable. They have to undergo a radical internal transformation. Uh, so therefore, the simultaneity requirement is unacceptable for that reason alone. Now, let me stress again that there's an elite consensus on this. For example, say, take the matter of freedom of the press. Uh, you'll notice that there has been no debate in the United States, no discussion in the United States, during this phase of the Accords on freedom of the press, say, in El Salvador. In fact, what we hear is they already have freedom of the press. And in a certain technical sense, that's true. That is, there's no law in El Salvador which says you can't have an independent newspaper. Uh, you don't need a law. There was an independent press in El Salvador uh, in 1980 when the United States moved in to turn it into a, uh, a Nazi-style terror state. Uh, there was a free press. In fact, there were two independent newspapers, not leftist or anything like that, mainstream independent newspapers, La Cronica and El Independiente. Well, they're not around any longer. In the case of, they were never censored because we hate censorship. In the case of one of those newspapers, uh, what happened is that the U.S. run security forces surrounded the office with tanks, uh, uh, destroyed it, uh, drove the editor out of the country with assassination threats after several assassination attempts. That took care of one of them. In the case of the other one, the, our security forces, there are forces, remember, our security forces picked up the editor and a, another journalist in a, in a restaurant in San Salvador, took them outside, cut them to pieces with a machete, and left them in a ditch somewhere, or the, the rest of them. That took care of the second newspaper. So there's no more problem of freedom of the press in uh, El Salvador. And you'll notice that nobody, none of these sudden libertarians who are so concerned about freedom of the press, have called for a reopening of an independent press in El Salvador. Nobody's ever heard the words La Cronica and El Independiente. Uh, you hear about La Prensa, including many lies, but nobody hears about free, and of course nothing remotely like this ever happened in Nicaragua. But uh, you never hear a word about freedom of the press in, San, in El Salvador. In fact, these events, that I've, the, these two newspapers, to be precise, there were three references to what I've just described in the entire 1980s in the New York Times. So you can't claim that we don't have a free press here. But uh, it was so, you know, if you're really a scholar and you've got a terrific memory, you can remember that something unpleasant happened there. But it's certainly not an issue. Uh, we don't look into the question. We don't, nobody calls for freedom of the press in El Salvador, and for two very good reasons. Uh, for one thing, Washington, the Office of Public Diplomacy, has ordered us that that topic is off the agenda. We're not supposed to talk about that, so therefore being loyal cowards, we naturally obey. So that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is that the call for a free press in El Salvador would be ridiculous. You can't have a free press in El Salvador 
without first dismantling the whole terror system that the United States installed precisely to ensure that you can't have things like a free press or, for that matter, Bible study groups that might turn into peasant self-help groups, and in fact, all the developments that caused Washington to unleash the terror apparatus. So since it's absurd to ask for a free press, I guess there's no point in doing so. In any event, no one asks about it. Meanwhile, I should say, in Nicaragua, nothing remotely comparable has happened. The opposition claims harassment, and of course it always hits the front pages of the newspapers, but they're not expecting to be murdered or tortured. And, and this opposition is extreme. It's the kind of opposition which has never survived in, in a Western democracy in times of crisis. Uh, La Prensa, for example, and the groups around it, uh, are openly support the U.S. attack against Nicaragua. Nothing secret about it. I just had the... I guess, uh, I'm not sure it's happy experience, but experience of reading three months' worth of La Prensa. I must be the only person outside the CIA who actually has all of La Prensa since the time was opened in my office at home. Uh, and it's just openly pro-contra. It doesn't even hide it. You know? uh, it's, oh, it's simply a U.S. government disinformation or organ. I mean, to allow the journal to publish, it's as if in the United States during the Second World War, uh, the media were largely dominated by... Japanese fascist journals calling for the overthrow of the U.S. government and the liberation of, you know, the territories in the Pacific from the racist murderers in the United States or something like that. I mean, such things are inconceivable. You know, they never happen in the West. Uh, and the same is true of what we call the opposition, which openly identifies with the U.S. attack against Nicaragua and regards the U.S. as their only basic political support. Uh, well, that, they, they do get harassed and, you know, they get censored and that sort of thing. They don't get murdered. In El Salvador, there's nothing even remotely similar. And it's not like the press knows all of this, but will never report any of it. Inconceivable that they report these things, though every journalist in Managua and San Salvador knows it. Uh, but uh, again, nobody is talking about the application of the terms of the accords, which would permit the, uh, an opposition, even a mild opposition, to function. Nobody's talking about those conditions. In El Salvador, that's off the agenda. And in general, all the simultaneity requirements are unacceptable because they would require the dismantling of the terror apparatus that the United States took such pains to impose and still supports. Now, another feature of the Accords that's unacceptable was international verification. The Accords had in them a provision for verification, an international verification commission, which included the five Central American countries, the Latin American democracies, the Contadora countries, the OAS, the Organization of American States, and the United Nations. Well, plainly, that's unacceptable, essentially for the reasons I just mentioned. International verification would put barriers in the way of the U.S. attack against Nicaragua and the U.S. attack against the populations of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras via the terrorist apparatus, the military regimes, which were either imposed or supported for that purpose. So that's unacceptable. Uh, another reason why international verification is unacceptable to the United States is that the Latin American countries, though dependent, of course, on the United States, after all, we are the 800-pound gorilla, they're dependent on the United States and there are limits beyond which they can go. Nevertheless, they have a degree of independence. They have a degree of independence, and therefore they're not allowed in at all. In fact, nobody with a degree of independence from the master of the hemisphere is allowed in. So plainly, international verification has to go. Uh, and in fact, the demolition job on the Accords was completed by January. By January, the simultaneity condition was thrown out, uh, international verification was terminated, and in fact, nothing remains of the Accords. They are finished. They are part of ancient history. Nothing remains of the Guatemala City Accords. The press may talk about the RAS Accords and so on, but either they're lying consciously or else they're unwilling to bother to look uh, the fact of the matter is there is nothing left of those accords. What is left uh, is a version of the accords written in Washington and transmitted by the press uh, and accepted by Congress, and that version says Nicaragua has to uh, accede to arbitrary demands stated by the United States government, whatever they happen to be. That's the accords. Uh, and that's all there is left of them. There's nothing left of the original text. Well, what were the means used to destroy the Accords. This is a very successful demolition job. Uh, what were the means used? Well, there were two kinds. There were military means and there were ideological means, you might say. The military means were, first of all, and most important, the intensification of the CIA supply flights. Uh, 
That was the most important event that happened during August to uh, January. As I mentioned, the supply flights, which of course illegal to start with, uh, were sharply intensified to about two to three a day. Uh, and uh, also U.S. surveillance flights, which they have a very extensive surveillance apparatus, all the fanciest SR-71s and U-2s and satellites and spy ships off the coast and so on, are carrying out intensive surveillance of Nicaragua, and that was extended too. Now, both of those operations are significant. Uh, the supply flights are crucial, in fact critical, because, as is recognized on all sides of this debate, uh, the Contras, the proxy army, are not guerrillas. They have no remote relation to guerrillas. Uh, the KGB doesn't fly two to three supply flights a day into El Salvador to keep the guerrillas in the field. And nobody's talking about sending humanitarian aid to the guerrillas. You don't have to because they're part of the country. They're rooted in the country. They fight inside their own country. They've got their own network of support. In fact, the reason for U.S. terror in El Salvador has been to try to destroy that base of support. But they don't need supplies. They don't have to get, but the, the Contras, on the other hand, have to get everything from food to fancy communication equipment to uh, boots to arms and so on, because they're not part of the country. They're a foreign implant. That's what it means to say, in fact, you re, you, nobody, nobody really denies, this is not a topic for debate. You know, the Reagan administration is the first ones to tell you that this force is going to collapse unless we continue to provide them with arms and supplies. The meaning of that, uh, which they don't bother to tell you in the press, but you can figure it out, the meaning of that is they're not guerrillas, because nobody does this for guerrillas. And in fact, that's written into the accords. It's under, well understood in Central America. You take a look at the actual wording of the accords, and they say that an, the indispensable element for peace in the region is an end to any form of support. And then they mention military, logistical, propaganda, or whatever, to two kinds of groups, namely irregular forces and insurrectionist movements. Now, the distinction for that is that the irregular forces of the Contras, foreign, for foreign organized forces attacking some country, the insurrectionist movement are, movements are indigenous guerrillas. And the indispensable element of the accords is the termination of any form of support for them, any form, logistical or whatever. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, the, as a corollary, the use of one country as a territory for, for insurrectionist movement, for irregular forces attacking another. In January, the International Commission, the Verification Commission, gave, published its report. Now, that was plainly the most important thing that happened in January. Here's this commission made up of the five Central American countries and the Latin American democracies and OAS and the UN had investigated all the countries. They finally came out with a report. Now we can finally get an independent objective assessment of the compliance with the, uh, uh, with the Guatemala City Accords. Well, it was mentioned in the New York Times. We have a free press. It got actually one sentence in the New York Times buried in an article by James Lemoyne in which he stated uh, that, the conference, that the commission broke up in disagreement. Well, in fact, its report was unanimously accepted, but that was the total description in the news report on January 14th, when 15th, the report was issued on the 14th. Uh, other, here and there, you could find, the Chicago Tribune actually covered it in this case, but there was very little coverage. Uh, what, and you can see why. The conclusions of the commission were just not useful for ideological warfare. Why? Well, first of all, the commission denounced the United States. It singled out the United States and the United States alone for condemnation because the United States had undermined the indispensable element for peace in the region by continuing its support for the irregular forces attacking Nicaragua from Honduras, and in fact from Costa Rica. And that, that's the central condemnation in the accords. Well, plainly, that's useless. Uh, now, the commission went on to say that they couldn't provide detailed comments on the particular countries of the region, and the reason for that was that three countries objected, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. The three U.S. terror states would not permit uh, a description. You can figure out for yourselves what the description would have been, uh, and, uh, 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 but the U.S. wouldn't allow it through its clients. It blocked any description of the... Uh, however, they did carry out a pre have a press conference in uh, Costa Rica, and there the delegates discussed, the Latin American representatives spoke openly at the press conferences of what they called, uh, they said that they were shocked by the attitude of patent fear in the faces of opposition people and trade unionists in El Salvador and Guatemala, the two U.S. terror states. Well, plainly there's no point in reporting that. Uh, the, uh, 
commission also uh, praised Nicaragua for what they called concrete steps towards democratization despite the ongoing U.S. aggression. Well, that's plainly useless. In fact, none of this is useful for ideological warfare, so therefore it didn't happen. Uh, and the reporting is virtually zero in the New York Times, which is the most important newspaper, worse than zero, one sentence which was a lie. Uh, the commission plainly had to be disbanded, and the U.S. simply insisted that it be disbanded. Uh, the main U.S. client in the region, Jose Napoleon Duarte, who is a Democrat by definition because he follows U.S. orders, is also one of the worst murderers in the history of Latin America, and he's reviled and detested throughout Latin America for this region, but here he's very highly praised. Uh, he uh, said with some insight, I think, that it wasn't really necessary to have an international commission of verification because he said the press would suffice for verification. That's quite right. That provides, that expresses a real insight into the workings of the press. Uh, well, that took care of the International Verification Commission, so one element of the Accords, the basic element of the Accords is gone, no more international supervision. Uh, and uh, recognizing that the powerful make the rules and the weak just obey, uh, Nicaraguan President Ortega then announced that Nicaragua would uh, adhere to the conditions of the Accords alone. A lot happened between the time of the speech by Noam Chomsky on the 3rd of March, 1988, until about the 3rd of April when this videotape was made. March 1st, the Contras attacked a Nicaraguan village. March 2nd, the Republican Contra aid plan was voted down. The next day, talks between the Nicaraguan government and Mosquito Indians began. On March 4th, the Democratic Contra aid plan was voted down. Two days later, there was an investigation of misuse of American funds in El Salvador. March 9th, negotiations between the Sandinistas and the Contras were canceled. The next day, the Contras released a captured American. The day after that, the Contras agreed with talks with Nicaragua. March 12th, Robert McFarlane pled guilty to withholding Contra information from Congress. On the 15th, the Senate voted to force the President to inform them about covert operations. The next day, the Costa Rican president opposed Contra aid. Then the Big Four was indicted for a conspiracy. The U.S. sent troops to the Honduran border, saying that Nicaragua had invaded, which Nicaragua denied. The next day, the troops did arrive from the United States, and the following day, Oliver North resigned. Duarte and El Salvador almost lost control of the National Assembly. The American troops moved within 15 miles of Nicaragua, and the Nicaraguan Contra talks reconvened. On the 24th, temporary truce between the Nicaraguans and the Contras was ironed out. All the heavies pleaded not guilty in the Contragate affair. March 28th, Nicaragua freed the prisoners under the ceasefire agreement, and the next day the negotiations began. On the 30th, Congress approved more Contra aid. April 1st, the ceasefire began in Nicaragua. The next day, the U.S. sent 1,300 troops to Panama. As of March 27th, 25,000 people have been killed in this American-sponsored Contra war against Nicaragua. And there's a very good uh, article in the uh, Propaganda Review in the winter of 1988 that's the anatomy of a disinformation campaign that illustrates very well Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman's view of the media and the way they manufacture consent to certain conservative uh, policies. What this article deals with is the way that the mass media presented the aftermath of an attempt to assassinate the Contra leader Eden Pastora that took place on May the 31st of 1981. Pastora was a Sandinista hero, a hero of the Nicaraguan Revolution who went to Nicaragua with the Sandinistas after the revolution and was a major figure in the government. He then left Nicaragua because he thought they were becoming too closely involved with Cuba and the Soviet Union. So eventually um, Pastora joined the Contras and started uh, engaging in fights against the Nicaraguan government to try to overthrow the Sandinistas. 
He got completely fed up with the other Contra forces, though, that were directed with the uh, CIA. So on May the 31st of 1984, he called a press conference to uh, denounce the other Contra leaders, to uh, separate himself uh, from them, and to renounce his uh, Contra activity. At that press conference, a bomb went off that uh, wounded uh, many of the journalists there, that uh, harmed Pastora and some of his Contra um, friends, and that killed some other um, journalists. Right after that bomb went off, ABC and uh, PBS reported that the bomb was set off by a Basque ETA terrorist who was working for Nicaragua. The Basques are a mountain people in Spain who want an autonomous country free from Spain and from France and had been engaged occasionally in armed struggle for Basque independence for uh, many years. And what happened was a disinformation campaign was set up that was accusing so-called Basque terrorists of involving themselves in terrorism, in political assassinations and violence in Central America as surrogates of the uh, Nicaraguan uh, Contras. Um, the source for, for this story was a uh, former member of the uh, El Salvador uh, Liberation Group who told the member of a Reagan group, the Office for Public Diplomacy, that the Basques were very active in terrorist activities in uh, Central America. The Office of Public Diplomacy was a Reagan administration office that was the first state propaganda bureau that the U.S. government ever had. That is an agency to create propaganda and disinformation for a very specific policy, which was that of the Reagan administration policy in um, Central America. So the Office of Public Diplomacy put out a report that they paid one of their employees to uh, publish that the Basques were very active in uh, terrorism in Costa Rica, El Salvador, and other uh, Central American uh, countries. This had the first effect of souring the relationships between the Costa Rican um, government and the uh, Sandinistas. All sorts of stories were leaked to uh, Costa Rican uh, newspapers at the time, the Costa Ricans were trying to get better relations uh, with the Sandinistas, that the Sandinistas had sent terrorists to uh, Costa Rica to carry out political assassinations, to uh, bomb um, people in the uh, Costa Rican uh, government and the U.S. Embassy and the Contra forces um, there. And although there was no evidence ever that Basques were actually um, operative there. The stories were uh, printed in Costa Rican newspapers. So after the Pastora um, attempt at his assassination, the bombing of Pastora, the Office of Public Diplomacy revealed documents about this Basque uh, terrorist group and claimed that one of their top terrorists were there, who was the one that was attempting to um, assassinate uh, Pastora, and that he was a Sandinista yeah, um, 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 <laughs> terrorist, and leaked this uh, story out to the uh, media. Well, ABC and PBS uh, both um, picked this story up. They were dupes of disinformation. Uh, on June the 1st, um, ABC, on their World News um, Tonight reports, boldly stated that there is, quote, growing evidence that the Sandinistas have hired international hitmen from a Basque terrorist group known as the ETA to have uh, Pastora uh, killed. They then went into the whole details of the supposed Basque terrorist uh, operations in uh, Central America and said that all the evidence points to this uh, Basque um, uh, hitman and presented this as a Sandinista uh, plot which some people thought might be a prelude to a U.S. invasion mm -hmm. of Sandinist, of Nicaragua, as well as an attempt to create hostility and tension between the Costa Rican and the um, Sandinisti uh, government. Now, this is ironic because, as it came out uh, later, the guy that really did the um, assassination attempt of the um, Pastora was, um, uh, was related to the John Hall, um, Oliver North, Richard Secord um, network. It later came out that this uh, terrorist, uh, whose picture was at the news um, 
conference, a well-known international um, terrorist um, w landed on John Hall's uh, ranch, got explosives from Hall that were provided by Richard Secord, who's a top man in the North uh, Network, and that uh, Hall uh, gave him the explosives, gave him the uh, false passport and press credentials to get into the press conference, and then helped him escape uh, later. This, was, uh, this came out in the Christic Institute's uh, lawsuit, which uh, began with the Lepenka bombing because one of the plaintiffs in the Christic uh, Institute um, suit was uh, Tony Avignon and Martha uh, Honey, who uh, Tony was uh, harmed in this uh, bombing. And so he did research and pointed to John Hall's um, um, ranch. So all the leads uh, pointed to uh, John Hall. Who Chomsky talks about other ways in which the media simply lie about things. For instance, he made a study of the Washington Post and the New York Times for January, February, March of 1987. He looked at all the editorials and found they were all anti-Sandinista. And he said, uh, Chomsky said, there are two very striking things about the Sandinista government compared to the other governments in Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. One, that Sandinista government doesn't slaughter its own population, whereas the other three, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, have killed over 150,000 of their own citizens just uh, in the 1980s. And second, that's never pointed out by the media, is that Nicaragua is the only one of those countries in which the government has tried to direct services to the poor and diverted resources for social reform and education. He said, well, Honduras is a little bit different from Guatemala and El Salvador. Uh, they they're, don't kill so much, but they just let the rich rob the poor. So it's also very interesting. His analysis in another propaganda review, this in winter 1987-88, Chomsky says that very interesting things happened in, in the 1920s. Um, he talked about even in World War I, a bunch of American historians offered themselves to President Woodrow Wilson saying that they wanted to do some historical engineering so that they could get together and engineer the facts of history so that it would serve the state. And in 1921, the famous American journalist and pillar of the establishment, Walter Lippmann, said that democracy can exist only if there is manufacture of consent among the people. So you can see the problem democracies have. Soviet Union or totalitarian states, they say, by God, this is it, and we have state censorship. But you can't quite work with such a heavy hand in democracy. So what they have to do, they have to control what goes out and they have to control what people think. So as Chomsky said, one of the ways to do this is to create a debate so that it looks like a lot of opinions are working. A lot of different information is coming in, but actually it's all working within a very narrow margin, a very narrow spectrum, all acceptable by the elites. Nomsky is one of the great uh, intellectuals of our time, and yet, let's see, I saw him once on with an interview with uh, the guy from PBS. What Bill that? Moyers, Bill Moyers had a so two-part uh, interview um, series with Chomsky at the time that his book, um, Manufacturing Consent, came out. But yeah. he's hardly ever on the uh, mainstream media simply because he's such a radical critic. Of them. I might note that he's a, he's a very respectable professor at MIT. He's one of the experts in the field of linguistics. He's one of the top uh, theorists of language and linguistic uh, activity in the whole uh, country. So he basically has two academic careers as a researcher and critic of American foreign policy in the media and as a specialist in the science of uh, linguistics, where he's probably one of the most respected uh, theorists in the entire world, for that matter. Here's an example of what the establishment uh, does to Chomsky, as well as not letting him on TV. He's been forced to publish most of his work with small circulation presses because the big mainstream mass circulation organizations won't, uh, won't do it. They're, they almost did once back in the early 70s. Warner Modular Publications, which is a subsidiary of Warner Communications, signed a contract with Chomsky, Chomsky and Edward Herman to write a book called Counter-Revolutionary Violence, Bloodbaths in Fact and in Propaganda. 
Well, the manuscript was uh, written and accepted. 20,000 copies of the book were printed. There were ads put out in the New York Review of Books. Promotional flyers were listed by it by the publisher. But the parent company, Warner, started sniffing around. And uh, Warner's William Sarnoff, who was offended by the criticism of the U.S. government, ordered that the publication not take place. Well, the president of the Warner subsidiary, Claude McCaleb, protested this and tried to work out a compromise so that they could uh, do it, but Warner was interested only in getting rid of the book. And they not only got rid of the book, they got rid of, of Claude uh, McCaleb, the president of the subsidiary. Then they did away with the subsidiary. Usually they don't uh, put uh, ideology over uh, finances. Obviously they lost a lot of money that they paid uh, Chomsky in advance for the book. They printed 20,000 20, uh, copies, so they must have lost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the book was such an explosive indictment of uh, U.S. foreign policy that they just didn't want to uh, publish it. South End uh, Press uh, eventually published it in two um, volumes. I think it was called mm. The Washington Connection. It basically is a study of state terrorism sponsored by the CIA the way that the CIA has supported state terrorism, for instance, in Indonesia uh, in the 1960s, the CIA engineered an overthrow of a democratically elected uh, government, and hundreds of thousands of leftists were killed in Indonesia uh, in this project sponsored by the uh, CIA. Later in uh, East Timor, uh, one of the Indonesian um, island chains, uh, the Indonesian government working with the CIA, uh, carry out a bloodbath uh, there of state terrorism uh, that, again, the CIA was uh, involved in. And they went through Vietnam, they went through Central America, all the ways that the United States government, and particularly the CIA, have supported state terrorism. This was just too explosive a book for Warners to uh, publish, so they just uh, covered it over. The incident created a big uh, furor in France that reported quite a bit about it, but not in the United States. Hmm. This is blatant censorship there. That brings us to the end of another Alternative Views. We'd like to thank some people who made this production possible. Our cameraman was Eric Eubank, audio person Kevin L. West, and our assistant editor, Christy Swear. As usual, we are very grateful to Austin Community Television, ACTV. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. We'll leave this little uh, sign up here on for a while so you can jot it down if you'd like to write to us. Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Goodbye.